Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the finalists from the National University of Singapore. So I couldn't have planned it any better myself. I am actually wearing two Uniqlo products on my body now. One is their Oxford Easy Care long sleeve shirt, and on the inside, I'm wearing their Arizona shirt. So when I actually purchase their products, what I go is I select which of the products I really want to buy. After that, I make sure it tailors to the fit of my body. And lastly, of course, as I'm doing now to everyone here, I flaunt it proudly. Today, our solution of select, tailor, and flaunt will help bring Uniqlo to new heights in the US market and beyond. A very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Joe. These are my teammates, Sharon, Mazuk, and Tuyen. Thank you for having us here in this great city. So without ado, let me go straight into considering where we are and how we need to get to where we want to be. So we see we want to achieve sustainable success in the US where we do not have a large presence at the moment. So, how do we then target and market this product to the people in America, especially a very competitive uh, environment in America? Secondly, our ops and distribution or supply chain is geared towards Asian markets. How then do we optimize it? Do we improve it to allow it to support our expansion in the American markets? Lastly, we see we have nascent online offerings and we see a huge potential here, especially in light of our CEO's comments. How then do we improve this online customer experience? Before we dive straight into our recommendations, let's take a deeper look at a situational analysis. So we can see here that Uniqlo's main competencies, I've tried to distill them to three main things. First is brand equity. They are known in Japan and China as a good brand. Secondly, of course, product quality. Thirdly, their supply chain control has allowed them to keep their prices low and to keep lead time low, which gives them a big competitive advantage. However, if you look in green, when you go in the US, the brand equity is not as significant as that in Asia, not as many Americans know us and what we are good for. However, we can still market ourselves in terms of product quality and supply chain control. And the implication here then is we need to focus on this quality and also we need to have superior operations and distributions to retain our price and speed advantages. Next, we actually look at the US competition as mentioned earlier. We see there are big in-season retailers which make sure they are kept abreast on trends, trends, pardon me, such as Inditex uh, through Zara stores, or big seasonal retailers such as Gap and H&M, which uh, big seasonal retailers, Gap and H&M, they focus on basic and fast fashion. Pardon me. And lastly, you see independent retailers uh, catering to all types of eclectic tastes in the US and such that all segments are effectively catered for. This breeds a very, very competitive market and as a relatively new player in this market, we need to carve out a niche segment to develop a foothold for success, success pardon me. instead of going out aggressively and trying to capture the entire market east to west in all product forms. Oh, I think it's a wrong slide. This one. And, and lastly, about the online strategy, we see a big potential in online strategy because most of Uniqlo's retail stores are concentrated in geographically dense cities. However, we see an opportunity in capturing the long tail from people living in minor areas where they, are, they may, might not be a significant population. Uh, Amazon have, has done this through non-hit DVDs as they realize that uh, many niche segments, when put together, aggregates into a large customer base. And therefore, we see opportunity here and we want to deal with this in our last recommendation. Given the competitive nature of the industry in the U.S. market, it's critical for us to select a niche in the U.S. market and also enhance our brand awareness. And this is what we aim to do in our first select strategy. We want to build a U.S. expression strategy through a carefully selected uh, niche market in the industry. And with this, we've selected the niche market to be 
to be U.S. college students. This is because we believe that our core products and our core values that we promote in, from Uniqlo itself matches with what these college students value and what they look for. So let's look at typical college students. Let's look at what they value when they shop. They value value for money because these college students are highly indebted in their college loans and therefore they want the best, rank, uh, the best value for each money they spend. At the same time, how they shop. When we look at their behavior, they prefer practicality over uh, luxurious uh, fashion brands or fashion trends. And this matched with the core product that Uniqlo offers um, through our basic range as well as through our practicality. And so with this niche market targeted, what we're going to achieve is to, um, it's to get them where they are, to attract, to put our brand and our products to where these college students are. And what we want to promote is we want them to induce trial of our product. We want them to be able to touch and feel our product quality. At the same time, we want to inform them of the unique little technology and how we pride ourselves in the quality that we offer in our products. Also, we want to increase our brand awareness amongst these college students amongst these college students that our Unicode products are able to assure you of the quality that we promise. And therefore, with this, what we propose is for Uniqlo to set up pop-up stores in universities to target these college students. So what we'll be doing is that we'll be setting up um, pop-up stores and they'll be conducted in the form of pop-up store tours around campuses in the United States. So each tour will be around, a, each pop-up store will last around one week long and they'll tour around the nations and the United States and we will focus on our core products that that, um, that actually manifest the, our focus towards quality. And these are heat tech products, our airism, our fleece jacket, as well as our basic products. And to further enhance the experience of our pop-up stores, we'll be setting up um, the Heat Tech Challenge. It's a campaign that will be, um, be implemented throughout the school itself. And here we'll be giving them a challenge of how hot can you go. So within these pop-up stores, imagine that they are heat sensors. This is because we want to be able to um, show them and inform them that our, that our technology and our product works. So what will happen is that with these heat sensors in our pop-up stores, students are able to use heat tech products as well as or, um, fleece jacket and airism. When this happens, as they enter the heat tech sensors, they will, they will be able to see how hot they go. Uh, measure the temperature of their body and this is done through and this will be implemented through a social media platform so this not only informed them that our product works but at the same time it also spreads to the other people through social media through the network effect that um, that Uniqlo is present here in the United States and so through this strategy, what we aim to achieve is a top mind awareness amongst these college students that Uniqlo is here to offer you value for money quality products and this will help in our retail expansion in the United States. Now that we have selected a niche market, the next step for Uniqlo is to tailor its supply chain management within the US itself to support its expansion. Now we pride ourselves in not only the price that we give but the quality of our products and Two key issues that we noticed while expanding the USA was that firstly, there's a high sh shop opening cost for the management itself and secondly, there's also high inventory cost because we simply do not have the supply chain management expertise that we have in our home markets like Japan to do so in USA. And the implication of this really is that we need to have a targeted strategic supply chain management system in order to support this expansion. So how do we go about doing this? If you look at the supply chain management of Uniqlo, there are two key areas that we found that should be the focus while expanding in the USA. And to start off, we have the operations. And one of the key factors that we mentioned was that we're not able to support, we need to support our stores with a reduced inventory cost, at the same time, reduce lead time. And hence, a, a suitable model for us to start off with while we expand will be the hub spoke system, where warehouses will be centralized in tier one cities, followed which our stores will be then situated in the universities as well as the um, sit, um, nearby cities within a geographical radius which will be supported by a manufacturing plant in Vietnam. This will, be a, a very, this will be a strategy that allows us to not only reduce the lead time, unit warehouse costs, inventory costs, but help us to tread the water and enter the market in a sustainable way in terms of our operations-wise. 
And moving on from operations, another very important component of the supply chain management that we saw was the distribution angle. And if at this point I may take you to a quote that our founders say, we really have to transform this company to be successful and complete. And complete. And the, the key here, ladies and gentlemen, is that innovation is key. Simply just opening stores is not enough. And on top of opening normal standard size, small size formats near the warehouse hub spoke system that I had mentioned earlier, we proposed the opening of Uniqlo virtual experience stores. What this would look like, for instance, these, this concept has already been tested in famous Europe fashion cities such as Paris and Italy. And imagine you're a customer. You can now walk into a small size Uniqlo store, take out your phone, and purchase the right fit of Uniqlo products that you want because we will have to. We will have the technology of LED TVs, LED TVs that will give you the virtual experience through this unique store format. And next, please. Sorry. So through tailoring our supply chain management, we are able to support the niche market that we have selected. And the last component of our strategy is really to flaunt the Uniqlo online experience because as Joel had mentioned, the online experience is a very key component of the customer's purchasing journey within the online experience. And if, you, if a customer currently goes to a website right now, we identified there are three key issues within the customer journey. If I were to take you through a simple, normal customer's process itself, you go through the processes of awareness, consideration, and post-purchase. But when it comes to awareness, to a standard customer, when he goes online, there's, there are so many multitude of sites out there. And hence, the problem for Uniqlo then is, how do you break through the clutter and reach out to them to raise the brand awareness that we need? Secondly, consideration. How do you get them to consider buying our product before even purchasing it? And that's something Uniqlo has to address as well in its online experience. And lastly, how do you enhance any post-purchase discomfort or customer relationship management that we can have? And three tactics that we looked at to address the online experience would be first, in terms of awareness, what Uniqlo could do would be blowfish marketing. For instance, through the subscription of a service such as the adroll.me, what, what it will allow Uniqlo to do is to track users' clicking behavior to understand the kind of products that they would desire. And this will help us to advertise accordingly and hence raise our brand awareness, breaking through the clutter and reaching out to them. Secondly, in terms of consideration, what we can do in terms of our online website experience is to provide online match matching services. When you are buying a Uniqlo shirt or product, one of the fundamental things you can do is simply by using the color wheel concept to just match the right outfit that you can. And hence, if you click a particular shirt model that you want, we will be able to give three possible reviews or three possible outfits that you can try on as a customer to induce the purchase on our online website. And lastly, at the post-purchase level, we realized as an online customer, sometimes you have to worry that the size that you buy may not be the perfect fit that you want. And how can we improve this? What we can do is to work with our logistic providers to have this additional option on the online purchase portal. Upon clicking, let's say, a shirt model and I want to buy it, what I can do then is to click another additional option that will have the 15-minute sizing check. So once the dairy man reaches your house, he would wait 15 minutes for you to try on the shirt to check if the size fits you. And through a simple measure like this, what you can do is enhance the customer journey, up, the entire online customer experience um, via the Uniqlo website. And through select, tailor, and flaunt, there are also certain risks that we looked at. But for instance, in our expansion, there's the need to train our staff. And you know, there's the need to train our staff in order for them to deliver the kind of quality control measures that we want to do. And on, as well as for the other strategies, what we want to do is also to tread the waters and try them out in a systematic, tiered approach. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the future is presented with uncertainty for Uniqlo through select, tailor, and flaunt we believe that we can bring about the next opportunity for them. And now that we have looked at these three strategies, what is the financial impact of these strategies? Thank you, Mazuk. So the select, tailor, and flaunt, we'll look at them qualitatively. Now let's take a look at them quantitatively. So we believe that US market has a lot of potential for us. So really the right way to do it is to how do we market our key core products to the US markets. In our select strategy, we believe that with the implementation of strategy, we are actually able to achieve our targets, set up about 200 physical stores across US markets by the year 2020. And this is able to contribute to us a $696 million in terms of US dollars revenue by the year 2020. At the same time, as mentioned by Mazuk, in our flown strategy, with the set up of, uh, of virtual stores, we actually expect 
uh, additional uh, contribution of 20 million US dollars by the year 2020 as well from these virtual stores. We took a more co conservative approach to uh, value the revenue contributed by the virtual store because this is currently a new technology, but we're still hopeful that this will be very much in the trend in the next few years. So moving on to the second part of our flown strategy, which is really towards the e-commerce markets. So we believe that currently the e-commerce market has actually contributed to 4% of new clothes and new sales, and it's currently growing at a, uh, at a uh, compound annual growth rate of 14%. But with the implementation of new advertising uh, for, to promote the e-commerce uh, strategy, we actually uh, believe that we can add an additional 10% in terms of compound annual growth rate to the sales globally for Uniqlo. And as such, we're actually able to contribute an additional 56 million US dollars in revenue by the year 2020. So we have analyzed a lot of these plans in terms of contributing to the top line growth uh, uh, very much. So what about the implication in terms of cost? So analyze the impact in terms of cost for the, all the, our three strategies, select, tailor, and flout. So these are the main cost drivers from the three strategies. For select, most of the cost comes from the setup cost in terms of the physical stores. So we actually budget of $400 million in terms of setup cost. And in terms of tailor, most of the setup cost comes from, most of the cost comes from uh, the setup cost of the manufacturing sites. And also, but, but the benefit of this is that there's going to be a 50% reduction in terms of salary expenses as a result of tightening the supply chain and shifting to other markets, shifting to other countries other than China. And finally, in terms of the flown strategy, most of the cost comes from the setup cost of the virtual stores, and we budgeted $2.5 million. And all this seems like, like a lot of costs, but actually, in the end of the day, they are only less than 20% of the incremental revenue that we're able to achieve with these three strategies. As such, it's pretty much worth the effort. Finally, we propose a tiered implementation plan. For the select strategy, we actually start by uh, we we'll actually start with a select strategy by looking at our current uh, advertising method. We'll actually assess the U.S. market, and finally, we'll start by setting out our physical stores. Uh, and also, for the tailored strategy, we also by you start by evaluating the Vietnam market in Vietnam in terms of the supply chain, uh, in terms of setting out our supply chain, and also we'll start by setting out the distribution center. And also, we have developed the key, uh, call KPS in terms of number of stores we'll select number of distribution points for Taylor, and also in terms of revenue contribution for our flown strategy, which focus more on e-commerce. And for e-commerce, of course, we'll be starting with the setting out the e-commerce advertising strategy as well as the virtual store. So finally, uh, moving on to the last, uh, oh, we still have time. Let's, let me elaborate further. So, uh, move, so finally, for our flown strategy, we'll start by, uh, of course, uh, setting out the new advertising strategy for the e-commerce as well as setting out the virtual stores. And after that, we'll be proceeding to beta testing. And finally, we'll fully launch these strategies. Yeah. So finally, in conclusion, we are presented to do our key, key objective. Our key issues are our three strategies, select, tailor, and flaunt. And we believe that these strategies will ensure that in the future, Uniqlo will be able to market itself to globally in a more successful way. And hence, in the future years, we have another HSBC, Asia Pacific International Case Competitions. Maybe if we invite students from the United States, and they will also come here, just like Joel in Uniqlo clothes. Thank you very much. We are open the floor for questions. What is Blowfish? So Blowfish Marketing aims to expose a brand to make it look bigger than it actually is. And for Uniqlo, one of the things we realized is that in terms of brand awareness, they are very low in the US right now. And through a targeted adv advertising, we need to engage Blowfish Marketing to really get the brand awareness out there for them to understand what Uniqlo is about and what do we stand for in terms of product quality. Okay, so that's great. I've now learned something new. Um, very good work, uh, very impressive on marketing. So big focus you had on marketing, on branding, on innovation. Um, John knows a lot more about this than I do, but I'm sure he'll question you on your long tail minor area strategy, <laughs> which I don't really understand how that can work, but it's interesting, it's innovative. Pop-ups, colleges we haven't heard before, very good. Um, great demographic. Heat tech challenge, love that. You know, I hope no one dies, but you know, it's great. It's a great idea. Um, I think you missed an opportunity to talk about, it's, it's not as interesting, so I get it, but you missed an opportunity to talk about risk. Foreign exchange, financing, funding, really key part of the business. 
Was there a reason for that? Did you think about it and decide it was too boring or? Um, okay, uh, because we are actually currently recommending strategies in terms of, and these are re strategy related to the operations of Uniqlo. So as you can see in the risk mitigation slide, we actually focus more on the operational risk. So obviously we consider financial risk in terms of uh, funding, in terms of growth. And we know that uh, if we look at the cost of capital equation, the most of the risk comes from, uh, in terms of financing risk, risk, if you have high financing, you will increase the cost of debt and cost of equity. Um, but we believe that with our strategy, we are actually able to give Uniqlo a better uh, chance at targeting new growth in terms of the US market, as well as through new channels such as e-commerce and virtual store. So that essentially is a viable business plan that's gonna lower the risk that's gonna be shouldered by the creditors as well as uh, investors who are holding uh, the ownership of the company's stocks. So we believe that that's actually gonna lower the risk of financing, uh, lower the risk of uh, our capital and also lower the financing risk. Thank you. Well, um, very good uh, presentation. Um, I think you started off asking really the right question. Uh, where Uniqlo wants to be? Who are the customers? Uh, you did a SWOT analysis and, you know, weak brand equity. So you can't just uh, give the stuff away, you know. Uh, so there has to be a building up of that. So I think that that's very, very good start. Um, I think you're, you're weaving in of, uh, you know, social media and, you know, a lot of innovations, technology, uh, pop-up stores and colleges, uh, uh, you know, and services, virtual uh, shops. I think you've covered uh, a lot of uh, interesting ground. Uh, I guess I, I was a little bit uh, unclear at the end when you said uh, you're still targeting 200 shops by 2020. Does that include the pop-ups or are those uh, regular shops? Because that's a different ball game. And if that, those are physical stores, uh, I mean, that gets pretty expensive and seems to go against your you know, online strategy. So I wanted to, if you could, could clarify that. I was intrigued also um, by uh, why Vietnam, you know, out of the blue, uh, and you didn't introduce that. I mean, right now we are in Bangladesh, we're in China, we, you know, we've invested in this joint venture with Pacific and Crystal uh, and Bros uh, in Bangladesh. So why Vietnam, uh, out of the blue? I mean, uh, yes, I am sourcing, but uh, are, you, are you suggesting that I close down Bangladesh and only go to Vietnam? So I, I'm, I just wanted to, uh, if you could uh, address that. So I'll go first. Uh, in terms of the physical stores, that's the first part of the questions. Uh, currently, the 200 uh, physical stores is actually uh, really physical stores. Um, in terms of the virtual stores, pop-up pop stores are really like temporary, sto uh, short, uh, temporary stores where you really stop at university, you sell a pop-up store for a period of time and then you take it off because that's really for making your brand known to the university, university students since that's our target audience. But at the same time, we still want to establish a permanent presence in the US market and hence we still want to have the 200 permanent stores, physical stores in the US. While the virtual stores, we really want to tap on the trends of the virtual technology, so we still want to have an additional uh, 50 virtual stores by the end of 2020. So uh, those, are additional, uh, those are additional KPIs that are set for our strategy. Uh, in terms of Vietnam, uh, we chose Vietnam because uh, we realized that China, China is facing very high increment in terms of wage expenses. Uh, in fact, it's been actually, uh, we are actually informed that in the past few years, China has actually increased, experienced an annual uh, growth of 20% in terms of average rich salaries, and that's gonna increase a lot of our production costs. Well, at the same time, Vietnam actually, Vietnam's production uh, salary expenses is actually half of that of China, and hence it seems to be a very viable option to shift our production site to Vietnam. At the same time, uh, through my own readings, I've seen that uh, there's this uh, known trunk, I'm not sure I pronounced correctly, known trunk, uh, Yongchang city in Vietnam that actually has a very good industrial sites that has a very established textile industries that's actually able to cater to our needs. And, and yeah, I think my TV wants to add on. Just to quickly add on to that, I mean, 200 does seem like a very large number. And when you mentioned the hub spoke model, so we didn't just take it out of anywhere. We looked at a case study, for example, Metro, um, a famous retailer in the Europe, actually started off this model within Romania to systematically roll out 
their rollout, the expansion of stores. And we saw that as a possible, it has been tried and tested, so it's a case study to help us to systematically roll out the stores that we want. And for the VR stores, the main element besides the experience is that you don't have to stock your inventory in these stores because your customers can just buy it and then have it delivered to them from the warehouse to their house in about three days' time. So given that, that's going to systematically help us in terms of achieving that target goal of 200 stores. Um, I have a question on the um, on, on the sourcing model, um, or sorry, the whole sorry business model. Um, Inditex, which I think is in the case study, is a fully integrated um, model, including production, um, and is the world's largest retailer, I believe. Um, whereas um, we um, take a, a partnership approach. Um, do you think we should? Um, which, which is the best approach, and uh, should we be considering um, alternatives, um, particularly as we? Um, expand um, globally? I think I can start first again. <laughs> I think um, our partnership approach has uh, been effective because uh, two broad reasons. One, we have tighter control over the supply chain uh, from start to finish. I think with a partnership system like a JV in Bangladesh, we will have more access for our experts. I can't remember the Japanese word for it. I think it's Takumi, <laughs> Takumi experts. To get there and secondly i think uh, we are better able to understand the distribution channels from our um, partners uh, to our end consumers so for instance you want to serve your markets in china you understand uh, the cheapest most cost effective way uh, to get your stuff from uh, where you produce it for instance vietnam to china i think uh, to add on one last point our decision to bypass the trading companies is actually a very important one because uh, we compete on price as one of the core selling points. And I believe we, we should continue this. Um, we were considering whether trading companies was a more viable approach in America where um, they, are the, they act as intermediary to coordinate and consolidate uh, before delivering it to us. But we believe that that would take away our core competency as mentioned earlier in the situational analysis of being able to keep price down uh, by even able to keep costs of production down. And to add on to that, um, Joel mentioned about how the Takumi team is very integral in our, pros um, in our operations. And if you go to the other end of a partnership, an acquisition, one of the key drivers of an acquisition would be if you're acquiring for the hard assets. But in Uniqlo's case, in terms of its quality control, let's say the Takumi team, that's not something you can simply acquire. And hence, to tread the waters, I think to manage the risk, like, and as mentioned, um, a partnership would be a systematic way to go forward. I guess just one comment, because I think the pop-up strategy, you've got to target uh, you know, uh, customers. I think it's low cost, brand building, and using their, uh, you know, all everyone's on mobile apps, and so you know, social media, it's great marketing without spending money. And if that works, why do you want to build 200 stores? That, that, you know, why not go online? Uh, I think uh, I think I think yeah. that's where I think you are throwing too much in. So you know, hey, this doesn't work. I go that way, and I go that way, and I have virtual stores. I only have a limited amount of capital to invest. Uh, so you have to. I, I think related to Gordon's point about uh, forex and, and other things, you have to look at the financial implications and the returns. Yeah. And I think the point is more. Small traffic in the U.S. is really bad now. Yep. The economy is doing well, but malls are doing And you are against, so how many times have we heard A&F, Hollister, Gap, no one mentioned J. Crew. I mean, these are all college kids, you know, they, they love it. But look at where A&F is today. It's barely surviving. You look at Sears, you know, is it going to survive the end of 2016? Will there be Sears stores? So, so you asked me to open 200 stores. That's where I really worry. If I could just have a quick response. I think when we did the case, uh, we thought the focus of the case was actually they're already in process of building uh, stores at a consistent rate and they are moving towards 2020, uh, having that 200 store target by 2020. What we wanted to do was to take a, a more measured approach besides their current approach, because we assumed that that was what the case was referring to, to have mobile pop-up stores. And we thought that would be a scalable thing, because if you succeed with university students, for instance, you identify working professionals as another group of people you want to target, then it can be easily scaled, perhaps, in the CBD. So we thought it would be a, a more uh, a targeted tier strategy. Thank you.
Thank you very much, the National University of Singapore.